Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Rich Harwood, president and founder of the Harwood Institute for Public Innovation, and welcome to Harwood Half Hour. We're coming off uh, a nasty midterm election, and today I want to talk about five practical things that you can do to create hope in this crazy environment in which we're living today. Um, just before we get started, um, flip me a message uh, just so I know that you can hear me uh, and see me. Uh, you may not want to see me, but at least so that you can hear me. And um, and also, let me just say that, uh, you know, we've got this little microphone here. I just wanted to mention what that is. We are um, decided to turn these into podcasts as well so that more people like yourself can have access um, to these Harvard Half Hours wherever you are. And you can take them um, with you in your car, on your iPhone, whatever whatever it may be. So, um, so look, here's the first question. Um, that I wanted to ask you as we get started. Um, what do you make of um, how we're coming out of these midterm elections? What do you make uh, how we're coming out of these midterm elections? Um, here's my quick take. Um, I think we're miserably stuck. We're just stuck. We're at a kind of impasse politically in our country. Um, I would even argue that, uh, that we're in worse shape today than we were before Tuesday, that we're probably more divided that we're probably going to see, I don't know, more gridlock, um, that we're definitely going to see um, more investigations of the president and, and others as we move forward from Congress, um, and that our public discourse is likely to get nastier, even nastier, um, than what we've seen over the preceding couple of few years, if that's possible. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to fathom. It's definitely hard to swallow. Um, but I think it's likely that it's, it's going to happen. Um, now, there are some people who say there's a conventional wisdom out there. I've been reading a lot about this, listening to other podcasts, um, watching the news, and there's definitely a conventional wisdom out there that says, you know, what we ought to do, what folks in public life ought to do, to, regardless of which side of, the, of politics you're on, is that um, we need to combat one another um, more, that uh, we need to raise the volume, that we need to take each other on, um, essentially that we need to do an eye for an eye, that whatever, um, as low as anyone goes, we should go lower. As uh, hard-nosed as anyone gets, we should get more hard-nosed. Um, the more prisoners they take on our side, the more prisoners on their side we should take. Everyone should be perceived on the other side um, as an enemy, um, as the uh, opposition, um, and that our whole goal is to seek them out and destroy them. Um, now, um, I happen to believe that that's exactly the wrong course um, that we want to be taking right now, that, um, that we um, need to engender, we need to create hope um, in our society, a sense that we're more hopeful, um, not dig in on cynicism and, and make ourselves even um, more frustrated. But here's the thing that's interesting about this. I said when I started um, that I wanted to give you five practical things you can do to create hope. But here's what I know about hope after working on this now for 30 years. Um, and, and as I say this, I want to ask you um, a question about this. Um, but first, when someone asks you to be more hopeful, what's your response? That's my question. Um, when someone asks you to be more hopeful, when they plea with you to be more hopeful. And here's my experience. My experience is that you, you can't ask someone to feel more hopeful. If they're not hopeful, if they feel like things aren't going in the right direction in their lives, in their communities, in the country, simply telling them to feel more hopeful doesn't do anything. You can't really urge someone to be more hopeful because just urging them to be more hopeful um, makes them um, feel frustrated as if um, you don't understand my situation. You're just telling me to, to be more hopeful when in fact you're not even acknowledging what I'm going through or how I feel or what I'm up against um, or how I feel about this crazy politics um, that we're experiencing right now. So rather than say to people, we want you to feel more hopeful or we're going to make a plea to you to be more hopeful, um, here's an alternative that I'd like you to think about and actually um, I'd like you to do. Uh, I think we need to engender hope in our communities and in our own lives, for that matter. We need to engender hope. And in this way, um, hope is an action. It's a verb. It's something that we do. Um, engendering hope is something that we create um, through the things that we do. And when we engender hope, 
there are ways in which people can experience it in real ways that give them something to believe, to be hopeful about, as opposed to simply saying, you know, I wish you were more hopeful. I wish you weren't so down in the mouth about things in the country or in the communities um, or in your in your personal life for that matter. So, so here are five practical things you can do to create hope um, starting today, starting as soon as this um, Harwood half hour is over. Number one, we need to take small steps forward. We need to demonstrate not that we're going to solve all our problems or we're going to fix everything. Everyone, none of us believes that that the challenges we face in education or in the opioid crisis um, or in crime, gun violence, there was just another shooting, as you know, um, today um, in California. Um, no one believes that um, we're going to fix these things overnight. But what they do, what does engender hope, is when each of us sees evidence that we're taking small steps forward, that, that it's possible to take a small step forward, that it's possible to get together with other people and achieve something, even if it's small. And I would say right now, especially if it's small, because it's probably, it's probably more believable by, by all of us. So number one, we have to start taking small steps forward to create evidence that it's possible we can come together and get things done. Number two, we've got to put the hard issues on the table. And again, much like taking small steps forward, none of us believe that by putting the tough issues around equity on the table or around racism on the table or bigotry, the types of things we saw in the Pittsburgh shooting or the types of things we saw in the Kentucky shooting um, last weekend, no one believes that by putting these issues on the table, we're going to resolve them today. But here's how it does engender hope. First, it acknowledges when we put these issues on the table that they exist. And I think what makes us more hopeful is that we can begin to see those things that we're concerned about, we actually are starting to put on the table to talk about. When we put these issues on the table, as I said, we might not be able to solve them, but maybe we can demonstrate that we're even capable, even just in small ways of getting together to talk about them, to tackle them, to wrestle with them, to struggle with them maybe even to make some progress on them. So number two is we've got to put the tough issues on the table. Uh, as I'm going through these, I want you to keep thinking about, so what are your questions about this? And, and one of my questions to you is how could you do this in your daily life? How could you do this in your daily life? So number one, small steps forward. Number two, put the tough issues on the table. Number three, we've got to show that we care. People need to know that other people still care. And so in this way, I think we have to find ways to bring people together so that we can demonstrate that we care about one another, that we have compassion for one another's um, experiences and the, the lives that we're living, that we have affection for one another and affection for our communities and affection for public life, for community life. And so um, we need to find ways and, and you know, Five years ago, I might not have said this, but but today I happen to believe this is one of the most important things that we can do. We have to demonstrate that we care for one another so that we know that some that other people really do care. Because right now, more and more we're hunkering down, we're going it alone on our own, and and it can feel very lonely. I think loneliness is one of the biggest things that we face right now. And and so we need to know that other people still do care and we have to show it. Number four. We have to tell stories of progress. And um, you know, there's an old country song, the refrain of which is, some of you have heard me say this before, I can't see me in your eyes anymore. And more than anything, what people wanna know is that their experiences are reflected in community life, public life, that they're valued, that they can see themselves, feel themselves, hear themselves. And, and so we've gotta tell stories of progress that give people a sense of possibility and hope, that give people a sense that our can-do spirit still is alive. And so, number one, I said we have to take small steps forward. Here, what I'm saying is we actually have to tell stories of the steps that we're taking forward so other people know about them, they can hear about them. And importantly, they can see themselves in them, which gives them a greater sense of possibility and hope. And it helps trigger in their own imagination that, you know what? I probably could do this too. I could do this too. So that's number four, tell stories of progress. Number five, the last one that I want you to think about doing 
is we've got to open up safe spaces for people to come together. We've got to show that it's possible that we can actually come into the same space, especially those of us who may disagree with one another. And it's going to be okay that we're going to be all right, that we can actually transcend our differences. We can cross boundary lines. We can actually come together. You know, a recent experience of this for me was um, I'm working with some interfaith from faith leaders who have come together from different faiths on, in an interfaith um, initiative. And they brought congregants from their six or seven or eight different congregations together one morning um, where people talked about their aspirations for their communities and for our country. And, you know, one of the things that I heard people say coming out of that experience was it was just great to be in the room with people who look different from me, who sounded different from me, who live in different neighborhoods than I do, who have different faith beliefs than I do. And we may not have resolved the world's greatest problems, but it restored my faith that we actually can transcend boundary lines and come together. And so we need these spaces where this is possible. So before I conclude, there's a couple of other things I just want to mention about this um, as we're going through it. To do this, it requires something of you, something special. And that is that to take action on these five practical steps to create hope, you have to exert a certain kind of discipline and you have to take intentional action. It, these things don't just happen. Um, and they don't happen simply because we wish for them or hope for them to happen. Um, they happen because we have discipline about them and we take intentional action. And I know I don't need to tell you this, but I, it's worth reminding all of us, um, especially just two days after these nasty, crazy midterm elections. We live in a world where, as I said before a moment ago, that we're hunkering down. We we're becoming less hopeful. Uh, people keep telling me increasingly they feel helpless, that they don't see what they can do to make a difference, to change the course that we're on. And in order to change the course that we're on in this environment especially, means that we're going to have to be disciplined about it. And it means we're going to have to take intentional action to run counter to the trends that we're seeing all around us. Um, and that's what I need you to do. And that's what I need you to think about. So it's great having you here today. Um, you know, as, as you know, we're celebrating our 30th anniversary this year, um, which is really amazing. I don't feel that old, but it is. We are celebrating our 30th anniversary. Um, our work is rooted in a philosophy of civic faith and is driven by the practice of turning outward. Um, our work has spread to all 50 states across the United States and has been pulled into 40 countries around the world. Um, in our celebration of the 30th anniversary, yes, we are celebrating what we've achieved, but most importantly, we are saying that we're ready to tackle the challenges of the next 10 years in our country and in societies um, around the globe. And we'll hope that you'll join us. So in the coming days, here's a couple of steps you can take. One, I'll have a blog coming out on what it means to engender hope next Tuesday. Look for that. Next Wednesday at 4 o'clock rather than Thursday, I'll be in Hawaii and um, we'll be doing Harvard Half Hour from Honolulu. Um, the weather will be, I'm sure, warm and breezy and beautiful. And hopefully I can bring you some positive thoughts um, from, from, from Honolulu. So until then, um, have a great week um, and, uh, and be well.